I told people from the beginning that uh, if you could stay away, stay away. And uh, so it looks like it's working, man. So uh, I praise God for that. And uh, the ones that are here is the ones I'm going to minister to because I really feel that God has given me a word tonight just for you. So turn to your neighbor and say, it's good to see you tonight. Yeah, amen. If you have your Bible, won't you turn to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. I titled tonight's sermon, lesson, preaching, teaching, whatever you want to call it, Now I Know. Now I Know. Turn to your neighbor and say, Now I Know. Now yeah, Now I Know. I want you to remember before I break the bread of life, I want you to remember this. What you do with the first, said it this morning, determines what the rest becomes. It, it, it determines what, what happens to the rest. In Scripture tonight, in Genesis chapter 22, um, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read a little bit because I've I got to lay a foundation for you. Uh, I've heard a lot of sermons on Genesis chapter 22, but whether you realize this or not, this is a first fruit principle. This is, this is a first fruit principle. So in Genesis chapter 22, if you're there, say amen. If you're not, it's on the big Bible right up front. Genesis 22 verse 1. Sometime later, God tested. Notice he didn't tempt, he tested. See, God will test you to make sure he can trust you. God will test you to make sure he can trust you. So the battle that you're in right now, you say, Brian, it's bigger than me. No, it's not. God will never give you more than what you can handle. So God says, I want to test you to make sure I can trust you. Does that make sense? He said, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, watch this, your only son, your first fruit, the only son you have, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Notice what it says here, sacrifice him. Sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey and took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God told him about. Verse 4. On the third day, y'all know what happens on the third day, right? This is a good word. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in a distance. He said to his servant, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy, the lad, go over there. We will worship, watch this, and then we will come back to you. So he already prophesied in his mind, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. Son, uh, Isaac is a typology of Jesus. Jesus also carried wood. <laughs> he carried a cross to Golgotha. This is a typology of Jesus. And as the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to the father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb? Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, I'm going to know about you. We, we preach this all the time. But I'm going to go ahead and shoot you straight tonight. I don't think I could have done this. I like to tell you a good religious answer. Say, yes, I could. Blessed be the name. But I don't know where I would stand in this situation if God told me to sacrifice my son. He said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Notice they went on. They didn't stop halfway. They kept going. They didn't stop halfway in the problem, halfway in the situation. They kept going. Verse 9. And, and they reached the place God had told him about Abraham. Notice the first thing he did, he what? Built an altar. He built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. The reason why he arranged it because this was a sacrifice he had never given before. This was not an ordinary sacrifice. This was his son. See, it's so important that you arrange the house so the Lord can enter in. A lot of people say, well, Brian, uh, it's, uh, well, what should we do about this and what should we do about that? Listen to him. It's very important that you prepare the house for the entrance of the Spirit. It's very important that we welcome the Spirit of God in the house. 
So many people are fly by night by the fly of their color, whatever, and they say, Brian, I'll do what I want to do. But it is very important, listen to me, it is very important that you prepare your house for the presence of the Lord. Watch this. He built an altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out, listen to that, he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, my, my. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. A lot of theologians say the reason why he had to call him twice is because uh, uh, Abraham was going to kill his son. He had the knife up in the air. He drew back, and all of a sudden, the first time he said Abraham just didn't work. He had to get his attention more. Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. He was what, this is what God said. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Hallelujah. He said, listen to this, do not do anything to him. Now I know. I used to say, Brian, I thought God knew everything. Well, I could blow y'all's minds tonight. I get really deep in this house. It says, you know, there's some things God don't know. Oops. Well, y'all look at me like, I, I thought he was omniscient, and I, I thought he was om omnipresent, and this, that, and that. There are some things that God don't know. Right here's one in the Bible. He said these words. He says, and now I know. Listen to me. And now I know. Watch this. It's going to get good in here. i got to teach you just for a minute, though. Listen to this. Now I know that you fear God. That you fear God. That's the problem with this nation today. We don't, have, we don't have a reverential fear for God. We don't fear the Lord no more. We act the way we want to act and talk the way we want to talk and do what we want to do and think hopefully we'll get to heaven. But I'm telling you, we serve a just God. We serve a God that it rains on the just and the unjust. We have a God that was wanting not just an ordinary sacrifice from you and I. God is wanting a sacrifice that is beautiful, that is precious, that is the first fruit more than anything in this world. God does not want your sloppy leftovers. I told you that this morning, and I'm going to tell you again tonight. God is peculiar. He's holy. Watch this. He says, now I know that you, that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up. Listen to this. And there in the thicket, hallelujah, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, and he took the ram, and he what? Sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Verse 14, this is the last verse. So Abraham called that place, listen to this, the Lord will provide. Yeah. Let that get in your spirit tonight. The Lord will provide provide. I don't know what you're going through in this house tonight, but I've come by tonight to tell you, my Lord, Jehovah Jireh, will provide for you in this house. I don't care if your bills are up to here. I don't care where you're at in your life. My God, Jehovah Jireh, will come through once again. Praise his name in this house. He's the Jehovah God more than anybody in this world. My God, he will never let me down. Jehovah God. So he says, my God will provide. This is the first time in Scripture that God was called Jehovah Jireh. First. This was, this was Abraham's first son, Isaac. It was his best, Daniel. But God told him, he said, I want you to take whatever you got, your best, and I want you to sacrifice it unto me. I started thinking about Abraham when he took Isaac up on top of Mount Moriah to be sacrificed to give God his first fruits, he raised the knife and God said, stop. Now I know. What did that mean when he said, now I know? Here's what it means, and what's why God laid this word on my heart. I've had this sermon for a little while, and I just want, I can't wait to even preach it to you. But he said these words, he said, stop, because now I know that you're sold out. Stop. Now I know I am first in your life. Stop. You don't have to make this sacrifice because why? Now I finally know and I finally see your heart that you're for real about your words. There's a lot of people talk the talk but never walk the walk. There's a lot of people that will tell you thus saith the Lord but never back it up with their actions. God said these words. He said, now I see. Now I know your heart. Now I know exactly where you're at. How many of you are thankful? Even though the world may not know your heart, my God, a God that knows my heart. He knows my heart. That's why you don't have to tell people what you're doing. God knows your heart. 
You don't have to tell people what's going on in your life. God knows your heart. Hallelujah. Now I know. God said these words, and I, I love that. He said, now that I know, I'm going to bless your son. I love this. Isaac is the seed of Israel. God says, I'm going to bless Isaac so much, I'm not just going to bless his seed, I'm going to bless the nation of Israel. And even though Israel tonight has over 3 million Arabic people that hate their guts, they want to kill them, they want to wipe them off the map, you will never hurt Israel because God is for Israel. And America better stand up and support Israel. Churches better stand up and support Israel because that's Isaac. God said, I'll bless them who bless Israel and I'll curse those who curse Israel. You want to see a messed up nation? Let them rise up against Israel. I don't care if there's three million and there's only one of them standing. Thus saith the Lord, Israel will never be wiped off the map. Never. And if you want to be blessed in your life, you've got to give God your Isaacs and not your Ishmaels. So many people are giving God their leftovers, their, their Ishmaels. And God says, I am not satisfied, even though I love Ishmael. God loved Ishmael, but God says, I'm not satisfied with an Ishmael. I want your Isaacs. I want your best. I want you what you can give me now. God deserves the best. Hallelujah. God don't deserve just our Sundays. He deserves your Mondays. God just don't deserve your Mondays. He deserves all week, seven days a week, 365 a year. Somebody praise him, 24 hours a day. He deserves it all. What is the church lacking? It's lacking sold-out, born-again Christians filled with the Holy Ghost and welcoming God in every time. I'm being honest with you. I know a lot of people that says, I know the Lord. Y'all do too. I know a lot of people that says, man, I, I remember walking an aisle and, and getting saved and born again. I remember going to vacation Bible school. I remember doing those things. But there was never a change in their life. And I'm going to make a prophetic word in here tonight, a statement. Y'all listen to me because it gets me in trouble all the time. If you act like hell and you talk like hell and you hang out in hellish situations, you're going to hell. You say, Brian, you should not judge me like that. I'm a fruit inspector. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 gives me rights. John chapter 15 verses 1 through 5 gives me rights. And I'm telling you today, there's been an easy believism all over America that you can act the way you want to act and do what you want to do and everything's going to be all right. I would say beware, 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 beware. We serve a God that wants more than your Sundays. He wants you from the top of your head to the bottom of the soles of your feet. That's it's my God. <laughs> Hallelujah. He wants it all. He wants it all. God says these words, I, now I know. Now I know you're sold out. Daniel, can God look at you tonight and say, now I know. Now I know. I just thought that was powerful. It stuck in my spirit when God said, now I know. And I'm going to show you something. Genesis 22, verse 13 and 14. God said these words. He says, now that I know... Now I can supply for you. Think about how powerful this is. Now that God knows that you're sold out, that you're just not in it in the good days, hallelujah, you're in it in the bad days too. Now I'm going to show you a word from the Lord he gave me, but I really believe this is, this is a word. Y'all know this is so true. 48,000 Southern Baptist churches in the world, and they're baptizing two people yearly. Something's wrong with that picture. You can have all the conventions you want. You can have all the prayer groups you want. But I'm telling you, there's got to be a transition from your mind to your heart. you got to say, I, I know he's here, but I got him there. That's where it's, at. That's where it's missing, guys. Now, this first fruit still, God has really laid on my heart. Did you know what? God will only take the church as far as he can take his leadership. God will only take the church. As far as he can take your pastor and your leadership. If we, I know this is a tough word, but y'all listen to this pastor. If we resist to grow, we will fail. I hear people say all the time, well, I don't want to grow. You're going to have a hard problem in heaven. 
You're going to have a hard time in heaven. The Bible says there is a number above all other numbers. A number that no man can even count, like the grains of the sea on the sand. So I really believe that if God can grow your pastor and God can grow your leadership, you will follow your leadership and will grow God's kingdom. Amen. It's tough. It's tough. I never, I never thought I'd be at this point in my life. I never thought, I'm going to be honest with you, I never thought on a Sunday night I'd see this many people. You know, you have 200 on Sunday morning, about 50 on Sunday night, and they call that normal. <laughs> but if you, have a, if you have a meet and eat time, you may gain 50 more. Y'all know I'm preaching truth in this house. It's like you've got to beg people anymore to come worship the Lord of their life. And I count it a joy. I count it a privilege to be able to open the Word, the sacred book of God, and say, this is what God said. This is what I know. And I'm not going to be the same anymore. It's a joy that you're in this house tonight. It is a privilege that you can raise your hands and say, blessed be the name of God. If you can walk and you can talk, you're blessed in this house tonight. We're blessed. Jehovah Jireh, he said, now that I know that you're sold out, now that I know that, man, you would raise a knife and kill your only begotten son, now I can provide. Same way with Jesus on the cross. That was God's only begotten son. And he was on that cross. And God, this time, swung the knife. And it hit him. That's why when I look at this cross... I can't back away. I've got to hold on to it. I can't let go. Because why? It took a man named Jesus to die for me. And we know this. We can quote the B-I-B-L-E. We can quote John 3.16. But I'm telling you the difference is when you make it a reality in your life. I started thinking. I started thinking about it took an altar. It took, people ask all the time and say, why y'all got so many altar calls? First of all, I need it. Second of all, you need it. Amen. And third of all, the best reason of all, is because God said give an altar call. At some point in your life, you've got to altar and you've got to sacrifice and you've got to come forward. But I'm telling you, it's going to take your best offering to be at this altar and to sacrifice. I started thinking about Joshua. Y'all remember Joshua? And uh, in Joshua chapter 3, they were crossing over the sea and all of a sudden though the river the jordan river they were crossing over the jordan river and i'll never forget this this is what god spoke in my spirit today and i'm excited to preach this i remember that he said joshua once you get over i'm gonna divide the waters for the second time and once you and the people get over i want you to go get 12 stones 12 rocks and i want you to bring them back and place this is where we place it place them in the middle of the jordan the middle i started thinking about that i was like why the middle? But here's what the unique thing was in Joshua chapter 3, Jamie. He said these words. He said, now Joshua, when nobody's looking, I want you to build an altar around the rocks. This is good. And what God spoke into my spirit was, I want to give you tonight. A lot of people are very good about praising God when they get through the problem. When they get through their situation, God, if you get me better, I'll praise your name. God, if you help me through my finances, I'll praise your name. God, if you let this relationship prosper, I'll, I'll praise your name. And what God told me to tell me and you tonight is this. The reason why he had to build an altar in the middle of the Jordan is because God says, I want you right in the middle of your problem, right in the middle of your situation, right in the middle of the walls of water around you, and it don't look too good. I want you to praise me in the middle of your problem. Problem. Not wait till you get to the banks and say, oh, hallelujah, everything's good. God says, I want you to build me an altar with rocks. Twelve rocks with an altar, and I want you to praise me before you get over. And see, what is why God called Joshua back is because he said, Joshua, you are the leader. Y'all listen to me, leadership. Listen to me, it's a good word. Remember me telling you, God will only take this church as far as he can take the leadership. At some point in my and your life, time of your life, all of our deacons' life, and all of our pastor, and Greg is the worship pastor. This is a tough word, but this is a word from the Lord. At some point in our life, you've got to separate yourself from the people and go build an altar. 
at some point in her life, in your life, make it personal. Before you get to your victory, if you can't praise him in the storm, you'll never praise him on the mountain. you got to praise him in the middle of it before he takes you over. Hallelujah. Twelve stones, which represent the, the twelve tribes of Israel. He said around that twelve tribes, Jehovah Jireh will be your provider. Build an altar around the twelve rocks. And there I call my man, the leader back, who's going to take you to the promised land. you got to get it right before the church gets it right. Listen to me. Let this word seep in your spirit tonight. Because here's the thing. If you, God, I really believe God's speaking this to my heart. So many people are waiting for a, a Walmart special. So many people are just waiting and saying, God, here I am. I'm waiting for you. What if I told you tonight, <laughs> you're not waiting on God. God's waiting on you. Yeah. God is waiting on me and you tonight to get it right. God is waiting on me and you to build an altar and to sacrifice our best in this house tonight. If you walk out that door the same way you walked in, shame on you. You've got to be a sacrifice in your life. I also thought about, I thought about, uh, y'all remember the prophet over in 2 Kings when he lost, he lost the axe head. Y'all remember this? Listen to this. See, this happened at the Jordan. Everybody say, that happened at the Jordan. Come on. Y'all help me preach just for a moment. I'm almost done, I, believe, I think. I got three more to catch up with Jeff. Yeah. I, th I thought about the Jordan, uh, and I thought about this, and the, where the axe head. Y'all remember, they, the house was too small. <laughs> the house was too small. And he said, we got to build a bigger house to place God's people. And I really felt in my spirit as your pastor there's going to come a time in our life as Elkhorn Baptist Church and other churches in this community. You're going to have to build a bigger house. This means yes. This means no. And this means go. Because here's the deal. I thought about the axe head. It, it got broke off. It went down in the water. And all of a sudden, the prophet stood over right where it went. And he said, oh, axe head, come up here. I like that. <laughs> oh, axe head, come up. How many of y'all are that crazy? Stand over, your axe head fell in the water. And there you are looking down. And I know it's down here. I did my cell phone like that one time. I've never done an axe head, hallelujah. <laughs> but here's what the blessing came in play, what God told me. It happened at the Jordan. How did the axe head swim? Woo! I'm going to preach here in just a moment. How did iron swim? Because somebody <laughs> built an altar. Somebody had a prayer service. Somebody said, here's where God is working, and this is where I'm at. They built an altar right where the axe head fell. Listen to me. If we learn to build an altar, because we know life's going to get tough. We know things are going to come our way. But if we learn to build an altar, God will make an axe head swim for you in your life. Are y'all getting this word tonight? Because here's the deal. Either you're going to catch it or it's going to pass you by. Either you're going to start growing in Jesus. I didn't say speak in tongues. I didn't say that. I said either there's going to come a maturity date in your life. And you're going to start saying, yes, I believe the word of God. This is where the iron fell. But, oh, iron, swim. That's not my stomach. Y'all, listen, dream with me just for a minute. Oh, iron, swim. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden, that prophet, he looked down. And all of a sudden, he seen iron floating to the top. You say, Brian, you believe that? If I didn't, I resign tonight. Yes. Yes. That's how confident I am, and I know that iron can swim when God's behind it. This is how confident I am. I know that you and your family can make it if God's behind it. I know your children will be okay if God's behind it. Oh, iron, swim. Oh, Elkhorn, swim. Oh, youth, swim in the name of Jesus. Play team, swim. Oh, come up, Iron. Come up, Iron. 
So you say, Brian, I don't know about all this. Had a woman come to me last night, and she said these words, and she said, Brian, she said, I don't think this is a Baptist church. <laughs> Isn't it funny how people always tie a denomination upon a movement? Boy, this is a good word. How people always tie a denomination on a movement of God. Do you know it's normal for iron to swim? Do you know it's normal for blind eyes to come open? Come on, help me preach. I don't know if y'all believe it's not. Do you know it's normal for 3,000 people to get saved in one day? Do you know it's normal to lay hands upon the sick and they shall arise in Jesus' name? Do you know it's normal what's happening here tonight? Because God is in this house like none time before. Never before. Give me more, Jesus. Hallelujah. I want more of that, God. Oh, I swim. Oh, I swim. We got to have more of him. Hallelujah. I'm telling you. People say, Brian, you, why are you yelling? Really? Really? I mean, you don't act like a Baptist. I'm not a Baptist. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. A Baptist won't make it to heaven if that's what he's going to heaven for. I'm going to heaven because I believe in the old rugged cross. I believe when Jesus died, he died for the world. And I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. Minus any denomination, to minus any affiliation, to minus if you believe it or not, because watch this, I still believe whether you believe or not. See, there's what makes the difference. I really believe iron can float. I know you do. I really believe <laughs> that God is working so big right now. And so mighty. And like, one day we're going to look back and we're going to say, oh, hallelujah, I felt him here. I seen him do this. And I seen him do that. But I'd much rather go to heaven believing with all that I am than go to heaven with a doubt in my mind. See, so listen to me. I started thinking about Jesus. He got baptized in Jordan. This is good. Axe floats in the Jordan. Churches get built in the Jordan. You say, Brian, why? Because that's where the altar was at. That's where the sacrifice was made. I thought about Jesus. He didn't go to any old water hole. <laughs> he went to the Jordan. I started thinking about the Lord. I said, God, the Jordan. Oh, let me go ahead and God just keep feeding me. But Naaman, Naaman had leprosy. You remember this? Naaman had leprosy. And he told him, he said, Naaman, Go dip seven times in the Jordan. Y'all remember that? Go dip seven times in Jordan. And all of a sudden, God went. He made a mud pie. He took that mud and he, he wiped it upon his eyes. He said, now go, go clean your eyes. See, a lot of us tonight have, have old worldly mud around a spiritual eye. A lot of us, you've got worldly circumstances in front of you, and God is telling me tonight, as for me in this house, what we need to do is go dip in the Jordan. Jesus got baptized, and all of a sudden he said he went down, and he came up, and the first words that God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm telling you tonight, if we as God's people, if we as God's people would learn to trust in the Lord, and lean not upon our own understanding. Quit trying to philosophically figure him out. You cannot do it. You're not smart enough. <laughs> they said that Adam used 10% of his brain. And he named every animal in this world. <laughs> A lot of people say all we use is 1% of our brain. And I believe that for some people. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Yeah, thought about Jesus. He went down, he came up. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And all of a sudden, a dove ascended and descended over.
over the waters. Can I tell you tonight, prophetically speaking to this church, that right now when you go with Jesus Christ, there's the Holy Ghost. He's ascending. He's descending upon this church right now. How many of y'all believe that? Let me tell y'all something. Y'all, last night we was praying around this cross. And Robbie and Jennifer, y'all here? I want you to stand up just for a moment. Because people think, man, I'm lying. I want you to tell this. We was here in this church last night. We all joined around this cross. I want you to tell them what you've seen. Right up there in the corner where the shadow of the cross is, I saw it looked like a face of Jesus when we started singing. And I told Robbie, I said, you got to look at that and see. I said, there's the face of Jesus. It looks like a shadow of it. And so we just stood there and watched. I mean, it was just, it was amazing. I could take my eyes off of it. And when we got done singing, the cross had, somebody must have hit it or something or it moved. And as soon as that last note played, the shadow just disappeared. Huh. And it was all I could do. I just had to come back here and sit down. Yeah. It was awesome. Amen. You say, Brian, what does that mean? I prayed about that. And I really believe that the Spirit of God is resting in this house. Really believe that. I really believe that God is here. He's working. And great and mighty things is getting ready to happen. So here's the deal. We say we believe in the Bible. But I'm going to ask you, do you really believe in it? Because a lot of times what happens when God starts working, we start questioning. Even though you can back it up with Scripture, we would have been really messed up in the upper room. We would have been so messed up in the upper room. And when God said that he walked through the door, and there his disciple was, the men, and there was women up there, 120 of them, and it said that the Spirit of the Lord rested upon him, and they clothed their tongues with fire. John said these words, he said, I baptize you with water, but the one that precedes me baptizes you with fire. The fire means the Holy Ghost. I had people come to me and say, Brian, how come we see God working sometimes and sometimes we don't see him working? Pretty simple. Because I think you take your eyes off the cross and you start questioning what God is doing and then he leaves. That's what God told me about that right there. When you are focused on Jesus, he'll show up and work in a mighty way. But when you take your eyes off God, you just won't sink in water. You'll fall into the world. So what God's speaking to me is this. I'm done. God is searching for people who are sold out. God is searching for people that he can say, now I know. <laughs> now I know. That Brent and Jess, they are sold out. Now I know, and now I can trust them. No matter how they get tested, I can trust them. So I'm going to ask you. Some of you are going through a test right now. Are you going to pass or are you going to fail? Elkhorn, I really believe as we grow, we're going to go through tests. Either we'll pass or we'll fail. So, youth, you are in it too. Are you passing the test or are you failing the test? Can God trust you with what he's given you? See, people want more and more and more and more. And God's sitting there going, dude, you've not even raised a knife on your first sacrifice yet. I remember when I was over in Russell Springs, God started really dealing with me and I wanted more of him. Now, I know it's an easy cliche. You can say that. And I always wonder, I said, Lord, why in the world did you move me from a church that was prospering? 180 salvations, building a $1.2 million facility. They offered me more money to stay than I've ever had in my life. They offered me a BMW. And I know y'all think I'm lying to you, but I'm telling you the gospel truth tonight. They offered me another day off. They offered me a $15,000 raise. They said, Brian, I'll, we'll give you this if you'll stay. And I'll never forget what the Lord spoke unto me. He said, you can't. And boy, that sounds good. 
money, BMW, and oh, by the way, they offered to pay my house off at $160,000. Now, I want you to think about that. I'll write you a $160,000 check, stay. It's a great offer. And boy, I'm not lying, I was sitting there going, wow. Oh my God, I've never seen a rich preacher in Russell Springs. <laughs> and I had all this stuff going for me. But I'm telling you, there comes a time you've got to sacrifice. You'll go where less money's at for the presence of God. You'll go where God tells you to go. No matter what the greenbacks are, no matter where he's at, you'll go where God's at. And that's why I'm here tonight. Because I know that I know God wants more of Brian Keith Rafferty. And I can grow here. I can grow here. And I think y'all want me to grow here. And I know you love me here. And I love you back. But I'm telling you, would y'all listen to me? In the name of Jesus, wherever the axe head fell, you got to go back. You got to say, you know what? It's down there somewhere. I know this is where I fell off. I know this is where I dropped my anointing. I know this is where I messed up. I know this is where it's at. Right here. Oh, axe head. In the name of God, swim. And see, I really believe a lot of you are afraid to confront your past. Because you know that's a skeleton. But I'm telling you, if you ever want to move forward in the anointing of God... You've got to confront your past head on. Amen? amen? Hallelujah. That's right. The kids are saying amen. And you watch what God's doing with these children. God bless them. See, I'm thankful to be with some people tonight that says money's not going to be my God. My children are not going to be my God. I told Blake a long time ago, Blake was acting like a heathen. Just like we all do. And I just told him this. And you say, Brian, you're mean. I don't, <laughs> I don't care. This is just right. I said, Blake, we're going to get up and go to church on Sunday morning. And Blake, this is the way it's going to be in this household. And Blake, if you don't like it, hasta la vista. The boy 21, time go anyway. <laughs> Listen. If you've got a child at home, 35 or 40 years old, still playing the Xbox. <laughs> go. Get married. Get out of there. Go get a job. Get a girlfriend. Do something. Just do something. My Lord. I'm being honest with you. My gosh, 40 years old and playing Xbox. Mom, Daddy, where's my lunch money? You graduated high school 20 years ago. Get a job. I'm being honest with you. You say, Brian, I, I have those kind of counselors. <laughs> it's crazy. I had a man come to my office one time. I felt sorry for his wife. She was sitting right beside him. And he was cheating on her. And that's what, I don't like that anyway, but he was saying this crazy thing. He said, I said, are you going to stop? Here's what he said right in front of his wife. Uh-uh. And I'd say, if I was Kung Fu Louie, I would karate chop you, drop kick you off the top ring rope. Amen. Something. And man, I'm telling you, he sat there and he cheated on her five times. And all of a sudden, and I just sat there, I looked at her, I said, leave him. I, did, I don't care what's up, I, leave him. The joker's sitting there lost as the day is long. And a, a, a good woman trying to make a bad relationship work. It will not work. God's got to put it together. And when God puts it together, it'll work. It'll work. 
When God puts this stuff together, it'll work in his name for and for his glory. My God. You say, Brian, I, I've never in my life. Well, you will here in a minute. <laughs> Listen to me. I'm done. Greg, you come. Y'all, y'all come. You guys come on. I'm going to ask you a serious question. Do you know where the axe head fell? This morning I told you either redeem it or break its neck. And right after everything was over, I had someone come ask me, said, Brian, what about a bad relationship? Now listen to me. You do not back down from God no matter where you're at. Y'all got me? Listen to me. I'm helping somebody. If, if they're not following God, If they're doing wrong and doing bad things, there must be a standard in your home. (coughs) Got to be. Listen to me. I am scared to death to mess up anymore. (coughs) I'm going to be honest with you. Can I just be honest with you all just for a little bit? I am anyway. (coughs) Men, your eyes will lust for the world if you're not careful. And I cannot tell you how many times I've had a female to try to derail me. I'm talking in this church. Huh? Boy, oh, cricket, 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 cricket. Lord God. I'm telling you the truth. And here's what I love. Last night, <laughs> My deacons, and I, I want to praise God for my leadership. Because, man, last night was one of those nights I was in a spiritual battle. And my deacons, this is what they done. They knew I was in a battle. And they came, and they just sat right behind me. Just sit down. This female was with me, and she was talking. She didn't do nothing bad. But what I love is Accountability. And I'm to the point in my life that I know all it takes is one lie to mess my ministry up. All it takes is one person messing up my ministry and I'm doomed. Even if it is a lie, people love lies. So I'm just tonight to tell you this. Be careful. Men, be careful. Don't get in the car. I know you say, Brian, where are you going? I'm going somewhere. If you're not married to that woman, now listen to this preacher. I'm going to teach you just for a moment. You don't belong in the car with the opposite sex if it's not your wife. It's true. Listen to me. I had people want me to do some counseling after 5 o'clock. Watch this. It ain't happening. Y'all get mad all you want. Because I love my wife. And here's what I know. When it's dark 30 out there, nothing good happens. Youth, I'm just going to be honest with y'all. <laughs> I wish I listened to my mama. She said anything after 11 o'clock, nothing good happens. I tried to prove her wrong. <laughs> it didn't work. Remain holy. Sarah, that's what I can honestly say about your life. I've known you since you was up to my knees. Now, I feel really old tonight. But you've remained pure. You've remained holy. You've got a standard like I've never seen a teenager or a young adult ever have in their life. I can bank on you. And I got your back. Thank you. So Elkhorn, guest, welcome to church. But here's the truth. Only you know what's going on in your life right now. If you're wanting to go deeper with God, there's some things that's got to be cut away. You got to remember where the axe head fell. And you got to go back and get it. So here's the thing. I'm done. Finished, man. Thank you. Y'all listened great tonight. Jordan. Oh, by the way, Jordan means transitioning. Elkhorn Baptist Church, we are transitioning. If we're not growing, we're dying. Y'all got me? If we're not growing, we're dying. 
So here's what I'm going to claim. I know what the Lord spoke in my heart. And I'm going I'm to believe the Lord. If we keep our eyes on that right there. Right there. And along the way, I can keep my eyes on it, but you know, a lot of things get in the way. <laughs> I think about Jesus when, when the woman who had the issue of blood, there was thousands of people at that time, and she literally got on her knees and crawled to hang on to the, to the garment of God. I had a dream, and I literally seen someone in this church crawling to the altar. And I hope it's me. I want God to break me and break you. Sometimes that's the only way you can be fixed. Some of you are going through a test right now, and I believe it's the whole, I can feel the Spirit. But God is testing you to see if He can trust you. Pass the test. Pass the test. In your marriages, pass the test. At work, pass the test. You've got to go where the presence of the Lord is. You know why God went to the Jordan? Because he knew that's where the altar was at. He stood right over that old altar. God, I commend my spirit into your spirit. And whatever you want from me, God, here I am. Start with me tonight. So I'm going to ask you a question. Can you ask the God, go to the Jordan tonight, stand over the altar where the 12 stones were at, and say, God, here I am. Start with me. I'm opening this altar up. And there's such a sweet spirit in there, man. Such a good, sweet, calm spirit. But you got to want more. And more and more. I'm not going to sing like Jeff did. But he's right. He's right. So leadership... God will only take this church as far as he can take our leadership. That's it. If God can't lead me and shoot a vision at me, if I'm, if, that's why a lot of churches are dying. Because the pastors are scared to death. They're afraid they're going to offend people and make you mad. They're afraid to have a vision to move forward because of the controversy with the people. A lot of churches are dying today. But listen to me. Because you're not letting the pastor grow. If you love your pastor, now I see a lot of guests in here tonight. It's a word for you. Support him, love him. Take care of him. Stand behind him, Michelle. Stand behind your man, man of God, living grace, he's going to have a new pastor. Coming up here soon. All right? Stand behind your pastor, love him. Even if you disagree with him. Tell him you disagree with him, but support him. Love him. Y'all got it? I just can't help it. I'm the, I'm the most blessed pastor in the world. I'm spoiled rotten. It's all y'all's fault. So tonight, wherever you're at, man of God, woman of God, wherever the axe head fell, wherever you're at tonight, I want you to come right now tonight and say, God, this is where the axe head fell. Right here it is. I know this is my issue. I know this is my problem. I know I can't go forward until the iron swims. Can't go forward until the iron swims. So tonight, I'm commissioning everybody under my voice. Oh, iron, swim. Oh, axe head, swim. And all of a sudden, bloop, bloop, you'll hear it. And it'll come to the top. Are y'all ready to receive this? Won't you stand to your feet? Come on. God's working. God's going to do a good work in this house tonight. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's going on.